You know, for a story that is supposedly predetermined by fate, Berserk has a surprising dearth of actual honest-to-god prophecies. Sure, you can say that Zod's warning to Guts was a prophecy, that Puck's journey back to Elfhelm was prophesied, and everything that comes out of the Skull Knight's mouth is pretty much a prophecy. But we're being technical over here. Even the prophecy of the Falcon of Light is more an Inception-style dream experienced by most of humanity, rather than being a poetic verse that spells out doom for the universe. Really, there is only one proper prophecy in the entire series that has that Azora High end-of-the-world feel to it, and it's frankly astonishing that it hasn't been spoken about in the story itself for over 150 chapters. The prophecy of the Falcon is one of the only things we know to be enshrined in the sculptures of the Holy See, and if you've paid attention to everything that has been going on recently, then you will know it's already coming true. But what exactly is this prophecy? How does it work? And whom does it apply to? We'll break all that down in this video. This is the Prophecy of the Falcon Investigated. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. It's the main threat looming over the world of Berserk since the beginning of the Conviction arc. What exactly is the prophecy of the Falcon? If you're one of those people who have not read the Berserk manga or seen any of its anime adaptions, especially the 2016 one, then you might have missed out on this little nugget of information, but it is quite literally the defining factor about the journey Berserk has been on since the Conviction arc onwards, so let's talk about it. The prophecy of the Falcon was first revealed in Chapter 95 of the manga, in the immediate aftermath of the Eclipse, after Guts, Casca, and Rickert are whisked away to safety by the Skull Knight. The lake where Griffith's Eclipse took place is visited by a retinue of soldiers, but it's clear that this isn't an ordinary mercenary band. The Holy Iron Chain Knights is a religious order made up entirely of nobility from every major territory that follows the faith and political guidance of the Holy See. That kind of makes them a weak fighting force by default, because sons of nobles don't usually make for excellent soldiers, but their introduction was not for the purpose of warfare. The Holy Iron Chain Knights were introduced as Apocalyptic Inquisitors, on a rather ominous mission from the Miracle Recognition Department of the Holy See. Their job was to confirm whether signs confirming one of the most sinister verses from their scriptures were popping up around the world. And you guessed it, it's the Prophecy of the Falcon. Once Commander Farnese de Vandemian puts an end to a quarrel between her Vice Commander Azan and her Herald of Arms personal servant clandestine half-brother Serpico, she is approached by one of her outriders who looks spooked out of his mind. He confirms that the Red Lake has appeared just as prophesied, and we get a rather gnarly two-page spread of what the conclusion of the Eclipse looks like in the physical world. This part will be blurred because of YouTube's community standards, so we'd suggest you go watch the final episodes from the 1997 anime or anything after the second Golden Age movie to really understand what you're missing out on. But if you don't want to do that, then this is our best analogy. Imagine pieces of Legos scattered all across a puddle, except the puddle is a bloody lake and the Legos are actually body parts that look like hellhounds have been at them. The sight unnerves everyone in the Holy Iron Chain Knights into silence, but not Vice Commander Azan, who finally gives us the prophecy that is the subject of this video. According to him, and later, Farnese who finishes his sentence for him, the revelations say that when the sun dies five times, a red lake will appear to the west of the city with a name both new and old. It is proof that the fifth angel will alight. The angel is the falcon of darkness, the master of the sinful black sheep, the king of the blind white sheep, the one who shall call upon the world an age of darkness. A pretty fittingly ominous prophecy, considering it was recounted in front of a literal lake of blood and guts but what does it mean, and who does it apply to? It predicts everything, from Griffith's incarnation to the advent of Fantasia, explaining the prophecy of the Falcon and who it really applies to. Well, the first half of the prophecy is immediately clear because of the contextual surroundings and the fact that Chapter 95's cover page has a giant black sun on it, with the faces of the damned swirling inside of it. When the sun dies five times, a red lake will appear to the west of the city with a name both new and old. Griffith's eclipse was the fifth eclipse overall, because his rise as Femto rounded out the god hand quite literally. The Red Lake was the site of Griffith's Eclipse, which is at the western border of the Kingdom of Midland, the city with a name both old and new. 
A thousand years ago, Midland was not a kingdom. It was the capital city of Supreme King Geyseric's continent-wide empire. The Kingdom of Midland derives its name from that ancient fallen city, and its current capital is Windham. But you get why Midland is the city with a name both old and new. As for the rest of the prophecy, it unfolded over the course of the next couple of arcs. It is proof that the fifth angel will alight. This is an obvious reference to Griffith's reincarnation as the demonic angel of longing and the fifth blessed demon King Femto. As for Femto alighting, it could be a reference to the moment of Griffith's transformation, but we think it fits his incarnation into the physical world a lot better. One of the biggest motifs of the Conviction arc was a pillar of fire, upon which Casca was supposed to be burnt, and the Falcon of Light, who appeared in most of humanity's dreams as a prophetic savior type, who appeared in most of humanity's dreams as a prophetic savior type figure. The moment of Griffith's incarnation at St. Albion coincided with the sunrise, so it seems to us that Miura took that portion of the prophecy and then layered multiple events on top of it to give it more meaning. But this is also where the confusions start popping up, because the Holy See's prophecy calls this divine figure the Falcon of Darkness. But the dream about the Falcon of Light is clearly meant to herald Griffith's return. In Chapter 127, when the King of Midland dreams of the Falcon of Light upon his deathbed, he sees Griffith's vague silhouette shielding Charlotte from him as he metaphorically freezes to death upon his throne. Ever since his incarnation, Griffith has been instinctively revered as the savior by not just every human he comes into close proximity with, but to apostles as well. He is the master of the sinful black sheep and the blind white sheep. This is a very clear reference to the fact that Griffith ends up becoming the de facto leader of human and apostle kind following his incarnation into the physical world. As a god hand member with a body of flesh, his natural existence itself was like a beacon of fire for his apostle servants. They were drawn to his flame instinctively. As for the humans, Griffith's life force was now so strong and malignant that it was perceived by Shirka and Farnese as being a maelstrom. We suspect that it is this magnetic ode of his that allows him to present himself as a transcendental being to the humans in his reborn band of the Falcon, because on more than one occasion we see various humans feel an instinctive sense of salvation and devotion as soon as they got close to Griffith and end up offering their services to him willingly as a consequence. And did we say reborn band of the Falcon? That's right, the wily bastard remade his old band, the same one he sacrificed to gain power in the first place, but added insult to their memories by making apostles a part of it as well. Griffith's war demons double as his vanguard, much like his raiders did back in his human days, and apostle commanders like Grunbeld, Locus, and Zod are clearly meant to be replacements for their previous human counterparts like Pippin, Judo, Corcus, and the rest. As the Supreme Commander of Midland's regular army, which is now the regular army of humanity as far as Falconians are concerned, Griffith already controls the two categories of sheep militarily. He is also betrothed to Princess Charlotte, the last living descendant of the Midland royal family, and is soon to be coroneted King of Midland, which would once again make him King of all humanity by extension, giving him the fact that Falconia is the sole safe haven for humankind in Fantasia. And speaking of Fantasia, that seems to be the Age of Darkness that the Prophecy of the Falcon is referring to. Though dragons and unicorns and such existing in the physical world sound like a dream come true, the reality, as the people of Berserk are finding out, is far grimmer. The merging of the astral and physical worlds leads to more chaos and catastrophe for humanity, as opposed to turning it into the fantasy wonderland that most people might assume at first. There is a reason that most humans are currently flocking to Falconia from all over the globe. It is quite literally the only place that can be safe from the astral creatures overrunning it. Astral creatures in Berserk are nothing more than imaginary beings given life due to humanity's strong belief in them in the first place, and because humans as a collective tend to have more negative thoughts than positive ones, it makes sense that Fantasia would be a veritable nightmare for humans. Imagine trying to fight off hordes of trolls not on a daily but on an hourly basis. Enoch villagers would abandon everything and get aboard Roderick's seahorse in a heartbeat if you told them that. The astral world is not an inherently malign place, but it holds a lot of malak within it, and when Griffith broke the seals holding back the world's spiral tree from penetrating the physical world, 
He let all that malice loose into the world as well. This is why the revelations quite fittingly refer to everything following the advent of Fantasia as the Age of Darkness, because that's exactly what it is, no matter how brightly the wing crystals outside Falconia might shine. The interpretation of the prophecy in conjunction with the developments that take place throughout the series point towards an indisputable fact. Griffith is the Falcon of Darkness. Heck. Void even calls Griffith Wings of Darkness Femto upon his reincarnation. But then why exactly do Farnese and the Holy Iron Chain Knights think that the Falcon of Darkness is Guts? For the two years that Guts was hunting down Apostles, the Holy Iron Chain Knights were hunting him, because they realized that wherever he was seen, he would leave a mound of corpses in his wake. They of course didn't know that those bodies probably are the collateral damage that occurred during Guts's fights with Apostles, or the Apostles themselves. For two years, the Holy Iron Chain Knights chased the Black Swordsman, thinking he was the Falcon of Darkness, when really, they should have been trying to kill the Egg of the Perfect World instead. If they'd known about Apostles and Casualty and such, they could have figured out the purpose of the Incarnation Ceremony and dispatched more forces than just Moskus and Farnese's men under the pretext of an Inquisition. But alas, they don't know anything about anything because they aren't true believers. In fact, despite being staunchly anti-magic, the Holy See's officials don't even seem to realize that their scripture itself was probably written by an oracle of some kind, because not only does it talk about Femto's birth and the Age of Darkness, it also records the four elemental kings of the world as being its four or cardinal angels. Just knowing that magic was involved in the creation of their religion and accepting it for what it was could have probably helped the Holy See influence the prophecy of the Falcon, as opposed to merely confirming it. And then there is the fact that nearly all of humanity now associates Griffith with the exact opposite kind of figure the Holy See's scriptures say he actually is, because he is currently chilling with the Pontiff himself in the Falcon's castle, enjoying evening tea with the High Clergyman as the prophesied Falcon of Light. Every Falconian in Griffith's capital firmly believes that he is their savior, and that being a part of his story was like being a part of a legend in itself. At a time when their lives were being ravaged by war, plague, famine, or worse, the dream of the Falcon of Light was what gave them hope for salvation. And that salvation was realized when Griffith gave them Falconia, even the Pontiff of the Holy See, who you'd think would know about the prophecy of the Falcon as the highest-ranking clergyman, performs prostration in Griffith's presence because he too dreamt of the Falcon of Light. But what does that mean that Griffith is both the Falcon of Light and Darkness, the Savior and the Destroyer, a bringer of peace and calamity? Well, not quite. Let us take you back to the Incarnation Ceremony and bring you to the exact moment where Griffith's incarnation was triggered. Do you guys remember what Puck said that the souls of the living and dead were crying out for in harmony? No, not salvation, even though that is a close second. It was God. It is the unimaginable despair brought about by the blood flow of the dead, Everything living or dead in the vicinity of St. Albion called out to God for deliverance, and then Griffith was reborn. You guys might have noticed how we keep saying that the dream of the Falcon of Light was had by most of humanity? Well, that's because there are people in Berserk who have never had that dream. For starters, Guts has never had the dream. Even when Skull Knight brings it up to him, he thinks of the pillar of flame his demon child had warned him about, and not the majestic white falcon Muria draws to signify the Falcon of Light. Also, Farnese has not had the dream of the Falcon of Light, despite having been a member of the Holy Iron Chain Knights and a fervent adherent of the Holy See at the time it was being spread through humanity's subconsciousness. If we take the two instances we've mentioned now and put them together, a simple line of reasoning emerges. Griffith used humanity's inherent need for God and his own inherent power as a God Hand to manipulate them into accepting his dream. Griffith is the Falcon of Darkness, there is no doubt about that. Everything he has done lines up perfectly with the prophecy of the Falcon, and we're honestly quite surprised he's been able to use the Holy See the way that he has been doing since Falconia became a thing because their scripture is where the prophecy comes from in the first place. The Falcon of Light is a distraction to keep humans pacified in our opinion. In Berserk, thoughts, ideals, and ideas have great spiritual significance. Griffith's existence as a god hand is nothing more than an extension of the will of the idea of evil, which is the closest thing to a supreme deity we are likely to get from Berserk. Because Griffith basically exists as an extension of God's will, 
he is able to use that ideal that humans have in their minds about God and his everlasting mercy and twist it to portray himself as the Falcon of Light. And so the Falcon of Light becomes nothing more than an image that Griffith needs to project in order to finally achieve his dreams using the most optimal path available to him. He could spend years fighting the traditional way, lose thousands of soldiers, and probably his own life, and he would never see his dream fulfilled. But if he just changed the world itself and made it enter a state where he would inadvertently be absolute, well, that's checkmate for him without him having to even lift a finger, metaphorically speaking, of course. Griffith's unyielding ambition that drew readers to him at the beginning of the Golden Age arc culminated in the great roar of the astral world. If what followed since that day is not an age of darkness to your mind, even after everything we've said, then you need a new dictionary, my friend, because it should be plain as day to anyone watching with an open mind that Griffith is in fact the one and only prophesied Falcon of Darkness, and there is no Falcon of Light. Marvelous verdict, but as for this video, that's going to have to be it. The prophecy of the Falcon is one of the most interesting aspects of Berserk because of the very reason that most people seem to have forgotten about it just when it became relevant. The final stop that Griffith makes before his climactic showdown with Ganeshka in his Shiva form is at the holy city of Ritanis. Ritanis is the epicenter of the Holy Sea influence and also where Farnese used to live. It probably has the Holy Sea's HQ in it as well, as Griffith actually speaks with a lot of the city's clergymen and nobility before the pontiff shows up to give him his valid pass. The Vandemian estate had been attacked by Ganesha's Pishacha and the Emperor himself in his mist form the night before. Everyone saw the demonic magic the Dread Emperor employed in his battle with the Black Swordsman party. A keener, more devout mind would have instantly connected Griffith's arrival with the prophecy of the Falcon, but alas, in that moment, politics and power prevailed. Frederico de Vandemian was more concerned with preserving his position within the Holy See than verifying the legitimacy of Griffith's claim of being the leader of Midland's sole regular army, as were the nobles and clergymen gathered around him. In the moment before the fulfillment of perhaps their most relevant piece of scripture, the adherents of the Holy See turned a blind eye to the Black Wings grabbing them, and the price for that will most likely be paid for with the blood and souls of Falconians in the future. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone!